Hi, this is Jim. This video is about reefing and in particular what conditions are like when it's faster to sail with a reef in than to have full sails out. Which is a little bit counterintuitive but bear with me, I'll, I'll take you through it. So I'm, I'm sitting here on Tango a J32 uh, in the San Francisco Bay and this area is famous for strong winds, particularly in the spring and summer and there's a zone right east of the Golden Gate Bridge where the topography and the weather basically combine to make really strong winds in a fairly narrow area that we call the slot. So we get a lot of practice reefing. And um, when I was first learning how to sail, I always felt guilty about putting a reef in. You know, I needed to put in a reef just to get the boat under control, but I always felt like I was giving up boat speed to do it. Um, so as I got a little more experience, I started realizing that actually I wasn't giving up any speed and I was getting to my destination faster under strong conditions with the reefs in than with full sails. And of course a lot of other experienced sailors say the same thing. When conditions are strong, you'll actually do better with reefs in than with full sails. So let's explore why that is. So this picture shows the J32 with two reefs in the mainsail and on top of that I've drawn a black line which is where the leech of the sail would have been with no reefs in the main. And so there's three things going on here. One, pretty obviously, is that the size of the mainsail is now smaller. And if you work out the area, it's about a 25% reduction in area with two reefs. The sail, on average, is also closer to the waterline. We've removed the top part of the sail, and that's important because that means we've reduced the moment, the lever arm, that the mainsail has to push the boat on a healing motion. So if you combine those two factors, the reduction in area, 25%, plus the change in how high that area is located, we end up with a 50% reduction in the healing force for that sail, everything else being equal. So that's pretty significant. And the last thing you'll notice is if you look at what's happened to the overall sail plan, on average the sails have moved their area towards the bow. That's because we've removed sail area entirely from the leech or the trailing edge of the sail. And as we'll see later, moving the sail area forward when you're close haul helps us counterbalance forces on the keel and hull, which are tending to make the boat round up. A key thing to keep in mind when we're talking about sailing in strong conditions is the relationship between forward force and boat speed shown on this plot. When you get up near the hull speed, which in in the case of the J32 is just over seven knots, you get this kink in the curve, and that's and basically your forward force is going mostly into generating more wake, and you get very small gains in boat speed. And so under strong conditions when you're sailing upwind, you just don't get a lot of benefit from generating more forward force, but you definitely generate more healing force, which results in both more boat heel and more leeway. You probably recognize this generic plot of what we mean by velocity made good, or VMG. Boat speed, of course, helps VMG as, as we move through the water quickly, but leeway is our enemy, and in very strong conditions, you can't adjust boat speed very much, but leeway can go up radically as the boat starts heeling over. So it's really controlling leeway angle starts becoming the dominant consideration when the wind is really strong. So for the next few slides we'll be looking at simulations. In all cases the boat on the left will have full sails and of course be more heeled than the boat on the right which has two reefs in the main. All of these simulations are in 30 knots of wind at a 30 degree apparent wind angle. So it's a close hauled configuration. Now the colorization in this particular image is based on pressure, 
where the darker the red color, the higher the pressure. And you'll notice in both cases that the sails are well pressurized, and it's pretty similar in both cases. So we'd have to say that the presence or absence of a reef doesn't really change how the sails work, at least on this side. But of course there's less sail area in the boat on the right. Now we're looking at the leeward side of the boats and the colorization again is based on pressure. So the darker the blue, the lower the pressure. You'll see along the leading edge of both jibs you have that nice low pressure region that really helps drive the boat forward, although both sails are showing low pressure, which is great. If you look carefully, you can see that the top of the jib in the reef case on the right is not as low pressure as the simulation with full sails on the left. And that's because with two reefs in, the mainsail no longer extends all the way to the top of the jib. So we don't have that beneficial complex airfoil for the entire length of the jib once we have both reefs in the main. On the other hand, both of these sails are generating lots of low pressure on the leeward side. And so this is, looks good from the point of view of generating boat speed. So in this case, we're looking at both cases from upwind, the fine lines are streamlines, which are the imaginary path that little bits of fluff would take as they went by the hull and sails. Besides the normal chaos, there are some interesting differences between the two cases. As the boat heels more, the windward side of the hull is projected more and more into the airstream, and so it starts having a more disruptive effect on the airflow over that lower region. You also note that because of heeling, the air passing by the mainsail and jib in the heeled case actually flows by at a slight angle relative to the angle of the boom. This doesn't change the airfoil section of either sail significantly, and as we saw, both cases have nicely pressurized sails. Now we're going to ignore the sails and superstructure and just concentrate on the hull. So in the unreef case on the left, Besides being healed more, the hull is also being forced sideways through the water. In other words, it has more leeway. And look how that affects the wake. You can see how water is piling up on the left-hand side of the hull, and that's literally the hull being forced sideways through the water. Now we're looking under the water line at the pressure contours affecting the hull and keel. I've just colorized the most low pressure regions in both cases. That's that blue area you see along the leading edge of the keel. Now that area of low pressure there is helping fight the pressure of the sails to push the boat sideways through the water. The keel is generating lift and so it's pulling back the other direction helping balance those forces. It's not easy to see in this picture, but there's actually a bigger area of low pressure for the heeled case because it has more leeway. So now we're looking at the high pressure side of the hull and keel, and those pink tan areas are areas of relatively high pressure. Now you'll notice in both cases we have an area along the leading edge of the keel that's pressurized, and also an area up by the bow. And these are, both areas are larger in the case on the left because the boat is generating more leeway and has to generate more lift to compensate. Now, you'll notice that the both high and low pressure areas are concentrated at the leading edge of the keel and up near the bow. And so these are forces that are trying to rotate the hull, basically rounding it up. Many times I've heard helmsmen say that they know the boat's slow because they're dragging their rudder. And, and what they're talking about is they have this strong weather helm effect. And that's the helm trying to compensate for these asymmetrical forces on the keel and on the hull. Just be aware that although the rudder creates some drag, there's so much more surface area in the keel and on the hull that really the majority of your drag is coming from those surfaces. However, the helmsman is right that there's something imbalanced if you're having to use a lot of helm in order to compensate for rounding up.
In this picture, we're looking at forces generated by the sails, and out they help counteract the forces on the keel, which are making the boat want to round up. The net forces generated by both sails are depicted by the black line. Now, I often think of that as being composed of both the forward component in blue and the healing component in red, but the reality of the sails is that they generate a force off in a direction which is shown by the black line. Now as you reef the mainsail, you're moving the sail area forward, which moves that black arrow forward and makes the sails forces more effective in counteracting the tendency to round up. Also I've noticed in very strong conditions, I'm tempted to just completely take down the jib, but it's often worthwhile to leave a little bit of it right up there against the forestay because that little bit of jib is as far forward as possible and helps counteract the tendencies for the boat to round up. Okay, well given that argument for reefing, why is it that everybody doesn't put a reef in when the winds pipe up? And there's a couple reasons. One is you may not have time. So imagine you're on a race and the marks are pretty close together. You've got to trade off the amount of speed you're going to lose during the time you put in the reef and then later take out the reef versus what you're going to gain over that distance. And if the distance is really short, it may be worth putting up with having full sails and those inefficiencies just to get to the mark without having to fiddle around with the reef. Of course, this is just another place where people can compete. And you'll see, particularly in the Big Boat series, crews out there practicing reefing on their days off. And in fact, they'll actually rig their boat with high-tech, very small diameter reefing lines that are low friction. And they'll put marks on the lines so that they know exactly the position for each reef point. And so, you know, a crew like that can get a reef in in a matter of less than 30 seconds. And so that's a competitive advantage for a crew that can have one more tool in their quiver, obviously they're going to do better when conditions are really strong. I think another reason people don't put reefs in, though, is that their boats just aren't set up right. You know, for a reef to be a practical alternative, you really have to make it easy to reef. And at least for me, that means I've got to have the reefing lines in the cockpit right next to the halyard because I want to, you know, I'm frequently shorthanded or single handing the boat. I can't go up to the mast and hook up a sail because there's nobody to hold on to the halyard. And plus, when, when conditions are strong, who wants to be screwing around up on the, the front of the boat? So having your boat set up with the reefing lines brought into the cockpit just makes a lot of sense. And one thing I've learned doing it myself, the, this boat came only with one reef. And it's a jiffy reef where you have one line that goes up to the tack and then through the boom and to the clue which is all neat, except there's a lot of friction in that. You're going through a number of blocks, and you know I almost have to fiddle with that reef. It, it's not as smooth as it ought to be. So when we bought the boat, of course it moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, we knew we'd need two reefs, so I, I bought a new set of sails with a second reef point, and I rigged the second reef with two independent lines, one on the tack and one on the clue. And I've got to tell you, it's, it's night and day. So. The, the reefing sequence with two lines is, of course, you let the, the sail out. Now you can control with the halyard while you're pulling in the tack line, and you don't end up with any extra sail along the luff because you've controlled it. So that goes real fast. Then you have another line which just has one function to pull tight the clue. You crank on that really tight because you're going to want a flat sail. And then the last thing you have to do is just pull up the halyard to get it tight again, with, which takes only a second. So even by myself, I can easily get a reef done in under a minute, usually under 30 seconds. So if you have a choice and you're, you're rigging your boat, by all means, go for independent uh, fore and back lines on your reef. It makes all the difference in the world. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, please feel free to, of course, leave feedback. And also, if there's other subjects you'd like me to talk about, I'd be more than willing to oblige. Thanks.